Great. Okay. Hi, and welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining joining us today. Um, so now we're going to have a uh, super facility and integrated research infrastructure session. Um, Debbie is uh, also going to be presenting about that, and she'll introduce all of the panelists and take it from here. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks everyone uh, for joining. So the way that we're going to structure the next hour and a half, uh, I'm going to uh, talk for a while. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of some of uh, just a kind of update on the work we've been doing in super facility, a uh, reminder of what that is and how that's translating to the uh, DOE uh, pro nascent program of the integrated research infrastructure. Some of you are going to be familiar with this. Some of you will not be familiar. Um, but so I'm going to kind of give a bit of an overview and then we're going to launch into a discussion uh, and we have four excellent uh, panelists who've agreed to kind of lead the discussion with some of the, the questions that we want to address um, around what the, the um, opportunities and challenges will be with IRI and then again I know that there's uh, people in the room who will also uh, have uh, uh, thoughts about that and so we want to have kind of a and online as well we want to have a, a really uh, um, uh, interactive discussion about uh, sort of keeping you all up to date on what's happening uh, around the super facility model. So let me uh, start with a little bit of an overview. So for those of you uh, unfamiliar with the concept, we've talked about the super facility model a lot at NERSC and at Berkeley Lab in the last um, uh, sort of five to seven years. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is the concept of connecting experiments and compute facilities, but the, the kind of aspects that go into the super facility model really go much further than simply connecting, physically connecting uh, an experiment to a networking facility to a computing facility. Uh, there's also a lot of um, software services uh, platforms that go into this a lot of development on all sides that needs to happen to make this work and a really key part of this is that um, there needs to be sharing of expertise and a sharing of the user community as a whole to to make this work and make this work effectively and that's true for you know on the NERSC side um, and also uh, true of on the, the the science side I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed about working in the super facility sort of program in the last few years is, is seeing how this has worked, seeing how different scientific communities are able to connect and realize that they have more in common in terms of their computing infrastructure than they might have expected and kind of all able to learn from each other a little. All right, so um, we've been working towards this super facility model for a number of years now. We uh, had a project uh, that we really used to kickstart this work. And so this project launched um, about five years ago. Uh, it was a three year project because every good project has to have an end date. Uh, and we really brought together people across Berkeley Lab who were working in various different kind of corners of this space. Uh, people sort of doing one off engagements, developing kind of one off solutions to particular problems that were helping science uh, experiment facilities uh, use ESNet and use NERSC more effectively. So we wanted to coordinate this, bring this all together so that we're deploying a coherent set of services that would be useful to all our users uh, and also that would be uh, a sustainable model so that we're not having to do lots of one-offs. We're able to have a support model that will last in the long term. So some of the features of this uh, was through real-time computing support through uh, high performance networking for a better deployment of data management and movement tools, including, but of course not limited to Globus, um, automation driven by uh, API endpoints, uh, interactive supercomputing through Jupyter, uh, trialing one of the first uh, attempts at federated identity in the DOE uh, complex and seeing how well that's gone. Uh, and also supporting edge services um, through our container-based, um, Kubernetes-based uh, uh, platform spin. Uh, one of the things that was really key to the success of this project and kind of really kick-starting this work is that we engaged with a significant number of science projects um, on understanding what their needs are and sort of iterating with them many times about requirements and kind of making sure that the tools we were developing were really useful. 
uh, again, this goes to the idea of having some scalable solutions, things that aren't going to be useful just for a very particular narrow user community, but that will be broadly impactful for all of NERSC. Uh, and if any of you uh, saw the talk that I gave about N10 yesterday, then a lot of the, the concepts that we've um, introduced in the super facility model have really made a big impact in our thinking and our architectural choices for uh, N10. So I want to emphasize that the work that we've done in the super facility projects and that we've been developing and continuing to kind of uh, develop in the last sort of year and a half since the project closed, you know, the work hasn't finished, but the impact of this work has been really broad and that's something that we're particularly excited about. So, you know, we have now over 20 science teams that are using the real time QoS to uh, process urgent data. We have uh, well over 40 projects now using the NERSC API. I know that there are a number of people who were, did the um, tutorial this morning um, to, to like learning how to use the API. Uh, we're logging something like one request every two seconds, which is a, a lot of requests. We're getting heavy usage from the API, and this is something we're, we're really excited about. There's a new model for how, uh, uh, how scientists can interact with supercomputing resources. Uh, we have something like... Uh, 1500 unique Jupyter users a month. Uh, this is now on a par to the number of users who access our systems via SSH. So we're really considering Jupyter and SSH now as both kind of equal uh, uh, ways of, of interfacing with our systems. And again, this is something that we've been really thinking about carefully for the N10 system is how do we support that and make sure that goes uh, smoothly. In terms of federated identity, we have over 1400 users now logging in using their home lab identity to authenticate to their NERSC accounts. And this is, uh, you know, this seems like something that should be very simple, very, very trivial, but it's, it takes a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes, both in terms of the technology deployment, but also uh, in terms of the um, agreement and kind of uh, making sure that we have uh, the right security stance in this and that we're, we're doing things in the right way that is going to be acceptable and going to be a model, and I'll come back to this, going to be a model for how this could be uh, deployed more broadly within DOE, within OSCAR in particularly. And then um, for our SPIN platform, you know, we have more than 85 projects using SPIN, and I think for these projects, SPIN is absolutely essential for getting their work done. You know, SPIN is used as workflow manager, it hosts databases, it hosts uh, data, uh, web uh, portals for data access. It's something that is really becoming foundational to how many scientists use NERSC. And so we're also constantly thinking about how we can develop skin, SPIN capabilities and uh, uh, make sure that we're deploying the services that people are actually needing. Okay, so we're in very... Uh, excited to see how some of these services are really taking off and the work that we did within super facility is having an impact if you want to learn more about this we did write a report um, this came out last year um, you can just google uh, super facility project report um, and i'm also pleased to announce we'll be saying more about this later but the super facility project team uh, have won the berkeley lab uh, directors award this year for team science so this is also something we're incredibly proud of, and this is uh, something that we'll be, uh, I'm sure, talking a little more about uh, next in the next couple of months. All right, so what comes next after Super Facility? Well, uh, as I said, it's not like our work for the Super Facility model at NERSC is done. We are continuing to develop new capabilities for the API, um, sort of bringing on the, the, some of the other you know, tools that we've uh, instantiated, we're kind of developing them, adding more capabilities, making them more resilient, all the things that we, we still know that we need to do. We're also really uh, keeping our engagement with the user community. We're trying to keep that strong and make sure that we're still talking and iterating with our science team so that we're, const so we're keeping up to date with what requirements are. But the, this is now, our focus is shifting slightly. Um, I think it's fair to say that super facility work has been uh, inspirational to some extent within uh, the um, within Oscar within departments of energy. Um, the there is uh, a nascent effort within DOE to integrate all the Department of Energy uh, user facilities uh, more closely. 
Um, and this is given the name of the Integrated Research Infrastructure, or IRI. So the next few slides are all the, some that I've adopted from a slide deck uh, from Ben Brown, who's the head of Oscar Facilities, a program manager within DOE, who's been really uh, a fantastic advocate for this vision, has really been uh, pushing for, for um, for this model of how uh, facilities can interoperate more seamlessly. And that's really what this is all about. It's about bringing together advanced computing, not just the Oscar facilities, but also local campus computing, cloud computing, integrating software, AI tools, digital twins, data management, um, and advanced networking, all to uh, you know, radically accelerate discovery and innovation. Um, but if you look at this diagram in particular and you squint, it looks very much like the super facility model. And that's because it is. Uh, you can think of super facility as kind of a, um, I use the phrase, a lower dimensional representation of IRI. Super facility is kind of NERSC working with experiment science teams. Whereas IRI is really not just about sort of science teams coming to one compute facility, but to extending that model to a web of compute facilities. So it's just easier for scientists to use the compute that they need when they need it. That's what we're really trying to work towards. Uh, so it's a, uh, about empowering the people and it's really focused on data as well as computes. So again, this is adapted from Ben Brown's slide from the, <coughs> the perspective of uh, uh, of the DOE program managers, this is the way that they see to um, fulfill the mission and fulfill the calls on DOE that are coming from uh, many different directions. Uh, so the value proposition is that it achieves greater productivity, we're avoiding duplication of efforts. Um, in, for researchers, if, if we do this right, we could reduce uh, time to insight, time to science, and really reduce complexity for the way people have to design their computing workflows. Uh, and for you know, those of us in the um, uh, in the computing infrastructure world, this uh, should make us more effective. It should make us more efficient. We can achieve more if we're working together. We're not and in each individual uh, supercomputing center. We're not developing our own solutions. We're able to share what we've learned learn from each other's mistakes, kind of develop all together. And this really makes us more, more impactful. Um, and it also get, gets us leverage um, with some of our partners who have similar requirements. And this kind of expands the reach and the impact of the, the HPC community. Uh, and another really key point here is to avoid single points of failure. And this kind of comes back to something that I know a lot of the super facility science teams really care about is what do they do? Where do they do their computing if NERSC is unavailable? Like where do we, where can they, um, where can they go to get their science done? And this is true, not just for sort of science teams with urgent compute needs, but really for all scientists. It's uh, having uh, multiple locations that you can go to to get your computing done will be advantageous for everyone. So that's kind of the motivation behind this and this is how um, Ben has been pitching this uh, to uh, to DOE and it's really gaining a lot of traction. So uh, NERSC has been very closely involved in the uh, IRI activities in the last few years. So this all kind of kicked off um, the start of 2020. Um, the president's budget request included a line item around integrated computation and data infrastructure initiative. This also appeared in the FY22 and FY23 president's budget request, which is a uh, language for IRI. So the there was a task force, an initial task force that was launched that was um, <laughs> really an Oscar focused uh, task force that started to think about what should an IRI look like? What does this mean? How might we work together? Uh, a report uh, from this task force came out in March of 2020. And then a uh, little under a year later, we really started to launch the activities that involved, um, I think, several people who are uh, uh, on this meeting now, where we had, uh, we started to put together community uh, workshops to design a, a blueprint for, for IRI. So an architectural blueprint, we call this the architectural blueprint activity, um, kind of making sure that we have requirements from all corners of the Office of Science, that we understand really what all the needs are, both from the perspective of computing science researchers, from the perspective of all the uh, different science um, areas that are 
funded by DOE and, of course, from the, the computing facilities, not just OSCAR facilities, but also sort of lab computing, sort of understanding what all the different, what the landscape looks like and how we might bring this together as, a, as an architecture. And so that's where we are now. The, the report came out, our report came out um, a couple months ago, uh, and we are starting to actually do some work uh, towards IRI now, which is kind of really why I'm telling you all about it here. So uh, Oscar's taking the first big steps in the last month or two. Again, this is a slide that I've taken from Ben Brown. There are four um, areas in which work is happening. First is investing in foundational infrastructure for IRI. So uh, we talked a lot about this in the Nurse 10 presentation. Um, OLCF just put out their um, uh, RFP for their next system. IRI is featured heavily in that. Uh, there was a few months ago a call for proposals for a new Oscar user facility, HPDF, the High Performance Data Facility. We don't yet know much about what that will look like, but that's designed to be an integral part of IRI, serving uh, as a distributed data facility. So these uh, IRI is finding its way into all the big investments that DOE is making in, in computing infrastructure in the next, next decade. Um, I'll go to the fourth one. Uh, this is something that's happening on the DOE side. This Ben is standing up an IRI program structure. This is, uh, incorporates uh, uh, various uh, programmatic structures and headquarters in the field. This is something that will take some time to actually become operational. Um, and it's all on the DOE side. So what I want to focus on are the uh, second and third big steps. So the, this is bringing the existing IRI flavored projects into formal coordination and then deploying a pathfinding test bed across the OSCAR facilities. So I just want to give you a little bit of an update about where we are with those two activities, because that's really where we're sort of doing things at the moment. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned that we did with Super Facility was bringing together work that was already happening, bringing it into better coordination and aligning it so that we were uh, gathering requirements from a broader range of scientists and kind of making sure that everything is going to interoperate and work together. And we're in the process of doing that same doing that same activity with um, with IRI. So aligning work that's happening across the different computing facilities. For example, federated identity. Um, we're, we're having lots of discussions, kind of three, four way discussions between the other Oscar facilities about what the right model is for developing federated identity for aligning API endpoints. We're the only uh, Oscar facility that has a. Uh, 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 the only OSCO computing facility that has an API that means you can do you know, more or less anything you need to do with, uh, with systems uh, and the leadership computing facilities are talking to us about how do we, how do we align that, how do we, uh, what's the best model for them to develop an API, which is going to be slightly different to us because their security stance is slightly different, but we need to make sure that from the user perspective, uh, API uh, usage of the different uh, Oscar compute facilities is aligned and looks the same. We can't have completely different endpoints in language at different at different sites. We have to coordinate this. I'm also looking at things like uh, data movements uh, and how do we better and more coherently support data movements and data management across sites. So, you know, this is that's a lot of talking, but where we're starting to do some more hands-on work is discussing uh, how do we deploy a pathfinding test bed. This doesn't necessarily mean a test bed for physical, um, you know, a physical test bed. This is where, how do we start doing the work? How do we provide space at the different computing facilities and at ESNet to do the work um, to make how, to to start deploying some of these um, technologies and services uh, that, that across all the different compute facilities and making sure that we have science teams that are involved from the very beginning that are driving what we're doing that we're not kind of going off and thinking that we know the right way to do this because we don't necessarily yeah questions as they come up yes yeah questions are very welcome so there's a question <clears throat> are there similar efforts like iri among nsf supported hpc facilities uh, that's one question. And then would IRI consider collaborating with those facilities? Uh, yes and yes. So the, the work that's being done on the NSF side is 
typically uh, a little bit more bounded in scope. Um, you know, it has slightly different flavors just because the way that the NSF facilities are operated. But there are um, some efforts that, that are happening. I mean, one obvious uh, case where um, where we uh, need to engage is the open science grid, which is a model for doing computing across geographically uh, distributed computing resources. That's something that we need to, um, we, we are, we are actively looking for ways to incorporate this. Um, we do have, I, I wouldn't say we have a huge overlap, but there is definitely some overlap in uh, scientists who are running on NSF computing resources and DOE computing resources. And although we're probably not going to have kind of a formal extension of IRI to the NSF space, we have to be able to interoperate there as well. And also like learn from what they've been doing. <laughs> we don't necessarily know the best model for doing all these things. We've got to be open to learning from um, anyone who has experience. Okay, so these are the things that we're, we're working on at the moment. And this is a pretty small team from the different OSCAR facilities. Uh, like we're trying to define the science goals and define what, compute, what resources we need to achieve those science goals and how we're going to um, like assign human and uh, uh, hardware resources to that. So it is um, very early in the process for this, but that's one of the reasons why we're, we're talking about this now. So there's a lot of R&D planned in the next couple of years extending this. I mean, we've already done a lot of the work at NERSC already within the super facility model. So we don't anticipate um, radical changes to how users interact with NERSC in the next few years. Uh, but we, we re the aim really is to make our users' lives easier, to make it easier for you to move your workflows between different computing sites. And we're committed to this. We're committing staff time and, uh, uh, and, and hardware as appropriate to, to this. And we're working very closely with the Oscar facilities, which I would say uh, even five years ago, that, that, that was not something that was a priority for us, like working closely across the, all the Oscar facilities. We've really, our kind of program has really brought us all together, focusing on some of the same goals, which has been fantastic. Uh, so what we want to hear from you all, um, and this is something that I've asked our panelists to think about, is what opportunities and challenges you see in working across multiple computing facilities and kind of getting any feedback that you have on uh, uh, what, you know, what your, your perspective is on this, if it's something that would be useful, if there are things that you're particularly excited about or things that seem possible, <coughs> or if it's not useful for you all, that's also something we need to know about. So that's what the next hour or so will be about. Um, so we have four fine panelists uh, who've uh, volunteered to lead the discussion here. We have uh, Heather Kelly, who's uh, a software developer and the deputy operations manager for the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. That's uh, part of the, the Rubin Observatory uh, from Slack. We have Dula Parkinson, uh, who's head of a beamline at the Advanced Light Source here at Berkeley Lab. We have Sterling Smith, um, who manages a software development group, um, General Atomics in the D3D uh, National Fusion Facility. And we have Jana Thet, the department head for data systems at the Linac Coherent Light Source at Slack. So uh, at this point, I'd ask uh, Ula, who's in the room, to come on up closer to the microphone uh, and for our other panelists to be prepared to answer questions. So. Uh, what I'd start off with, uh, these are the, the sort of starter questions, uh, and I'm going to start off by asking a panelist to, to kind of give their thoughts, particularly on opportunities uh, and then challenges that you see um, f around IRI, um, and then welcome other feedback from, from everyone else. So uh, I can start uh, online. Um, we'll ask, ask Heather, then Jana, then Sterling, then Dula to, to give your perspectives. Uh, the, those are the word, order in which you're showing up in my, uh, <laughs> uh, my Zoom. Yeah, sure. So, no. so thank you, Debbie, for the opportunity. And this was a very, you know, this is obviously a very interesting topic for, for us. So I'm Heather Kelly. I'm with the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So we are one of the science collaborations associated with the Rubin, LSS, um, Rubin Observatory, which will be starting the LSST survey um, 
the operations will begin in 2025. So, you know, at that time, uh, certainly, you know, right now we're in the development phase of our pipelines and workflows. Um, and by 2025, we're going to be in production mode. So, um, you know, I can definitely see our, our IRI, you know, providing this benefit of workflow animate, automation, resiliency and redundancy. Um, and, you know, I would want us to start now to really think about, you know, what can we do in developing our workflows today to help leverage this as it becomes available. Um, I mean, another piece of this is, you know, data movement. So um, you know, we're already very excited by the high performance network link between Slack and NERSC, where Slack is um, the Rubin US data facility. So it will be housing all of the data that the LSSP survey produces. And we'll obviously, Desk is utilizing NERSC as its primary um, data processing facility. So we are anticipating you know, a great need to move that data you know, potentially back and forth. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, 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 so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things here to unpack, and I'm very much looking forward to you know, learning more about what RRI and the test, you know, specifically what the pathfinding test bed looks like, and seeing how we can you know, plug into that as much as we can to prepare because you know of our timeline. Great, thanks, Heather. Uh, Yana, do you want to share your your thoughts, initial thoughts on this? Sure. So uh, the Linux Coherent Light Source um, has just seen first light from its new superconducting um, accelerator. Um, and so we've just made the leap from um, 120 um, X-ray pulses per second, so 120 independent experiments happening per second, to a million. Um, and that's a pretty exciting and demanding leap, and it's a pretty big jump in the data rate that's coming out of the experiments that we see. And the data system needs to make a leap that's consistent with that leap in repetition rate in the X-ray source. Um, and so what we've done is we've um, pretty much benchmarked all of the experiments that we expect we'll want to be able to do um, with this new and exciting source that we have. And we've seen that that you know most most experiments will fit with the compute facility within the compute facility that we have locally on site. But there's about 20% that require exascale computing resources. There's no way that the DOE is going to build us an exascale compute facility at Slack simply to do those 20% of experiments that we'd very much like to do. So the choice is either to not do them or to find computing elsewhere. And so the solution is to find the computing elsewhere. And um, without um, the IRI and things like the NERSC super facility, we would not be able to do those experiments. So this, the IRI is really um, an, an uh, enabler of, of technology. It, it enables us to stream data to a remote site, to remote computing, um, eliminating you know, the, the limits of time and distance. So we get to stream data out to a remote site. Um, we spin up hundreds of thousands of cores in near real time and return the results back to LCLS so that the scientists can look at their data as it's coming, almost as it's coming in within minutes of, of, of it coming in and then um, react to that data in your real time, which is what you need when you have only five days to, uh, to get your data and get out. So imagine a core graduate student sitting on a beam line, their thesis depends on it and they need an exascale computer in order to analyze their results. And in fact, they need that exascale computer to work for them in real time while they're taking their data um, and you know, there's a lot of pressure here. So this is a transformative uh, opportunity and capability. Um, and once you enable that sort of scale of computing, all of a sudden the whole world opens up to you. You can start doing multimodal um, experiments. You can start doing things that combine your ability to uh, combine data with other light sources, combine simulation data with experimental data, possibly in real time so that you can start um, informing experiments with simulation. And this really um, it leverages you know, all of the best things that, that, that the DOE is doing at the same time to uh, accelerate scientific insight. Um, so I think this is a, a, a real enabling technology that can uh, elevate science to a, a whole new level. Great. 
Thank you, Jana. Uh, Sterling, do you want to give us your your first thoughts on this? Yes. Um, so as I as I thought about the opportunities that are presented for 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 D3D and, and for fusion in general, um, we have not done very well at expanding our analyses, our automated analyses um, beyond our local infrastructure. And, and during this last year, we've had the opportunity to to take more advantage of, of NERSC for its uh, computing capabilities. And so the opportunity really is to, you know, further expand all of these these possible analyses that may get done only on a on a select few of our discharges um, where we should be doing these kinds of auto automated analyses all for all of our discharges instead. Um, I also see opportunities for for using a larger database of of analyses to create machine learning and 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 artificial intelligence models to be able to control our our future fusion experiments uh, not in the in the NERSC real time sense, but in the uh, on the machine microsecond real time sense. Um, so, so those are some some of the opportunities. One of the specific challenges I see for our for our project is that we store our, our our raw data in a very particular format, and it turns out that it will be it will take some it, it it will be challenging to access that data from offsite, and so we need to figure out how to how to do that, and uh, so that we can can access more of that data. Um, as well, uh, just getting our scientists used to the idea of, of using non-local computing resources. Uh, there's very used to just whatever we have available locally and then getting, you know, that's a, a, a different kind of a problem, but but getting users to think outside the box and and really try other, uh, other resources. Thanks, Sterling. Uh, Dula, do you wanna? I'm there. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably best to make sure people uh, online can hear you. So um, we had our ALS user meeting two weeks ago, and um, it was we had what we call visioning workshops because uh, we're having a major upgrade of our facility coming in the next few years. So this workshop was about thinking about what's the ALS going to look like 10 years from now. And so I wanted to pass on a couple of the ideas I heard there. So it, uh, I was in the Earth and Environmental Science section. One of the biggest things that they talked a lot about is, you know, to, as they're thinking about climate change and like all these different aspects, having multimodal, like multi facility science was like sort of the most important thing to them. It's not like there's one technique to rule them all. Really, there's so many different techniques that they need to use in a multimodal way. And so, and I think um, Yana said said so about multimodal, and, and we think that you know IRI. It's really like if if you're just talking about one facility, why have IRI? It's like IRI is so big. <laughs> IRI is really about having like a lot of facilities being able to do stuff. And so let me pass on one more idea that came up at our user meeting, sort of, you know, once you have all this data and all this compute, what we're imagining is uh, as a user puts in a proposal, <laughs> um, the, the proposal has some text in it and, you know, our AI monster goes to work and it basically, based on all the data that's already in the IRI, it simulates the results of the experiment that the user has proposed to do, analyzes the data, and then tells the user, here's what we expect your experiment to do, here's the settings that we think will best optimize the outcome, and then the user comes prepared and can be like really ready to do their experiment because they know what's expected already. But to do that, you really have to have a lot of different kinds of data, all there, all like being crunched to be able to generate your fake data be able to generate the processing to prepare them to then like optimize the sort of be prepared to optimize the things. And so we think that's the kind of thing that the IRI should enable. So. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so I uh, also wanted to ask our panelists, some of you already addressed this, but um, I wanted to ask if there, if there are things here that, that particularly concern you, you know, things that you see as challenging things that maybe uh, conceptual challenges, things that are sociological, as, as Sterling kind of alluded to, um, but you know, something any challenges that you see as as technical challenges. You know, what the the panelists have had some time to sit with this, so I'm sure they come up with some things that uh, that might be worrying you about the potential for IRI. Uh, 
Uh, Jana, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I can, I can go first unless somebody else wants to go first. Do you want to go in order? Go ahead. Go ahead, Jana. Okay. We'll go on. Okay. I'm, I'm going for it. Okay, so <laughs> so the, I think one, for me, the, the biggest thing that I, that I really worry about is that um, you know, this is a this is a big change for a community that has already gone through some some phase some computing challenges and changes in in recent years, and I don't know that they've caught up to those changes already, right? So they haven't caught up to the computing changes they've been asked to embrace um, up till now, and we're asking them to make yet another even bigger leap. And so I don't I worry that we're not meeting the users where they, they are. Which is why I especially liked your slide where you you said that you know part of the IRI is really to um, not just um, connect the computing and the researchers and the data, but also to create a community of researchers and people to help each other and to create an ecosystem of tools um, <coughs> so that you can elevate the whole community um, and bring everyone up to the same level so that they can all work together and and um, and, and really get to the same level and, and make, make ease of use um, a component of the system. Because I think ease of use is going to be very important because the computing sophistication, uh, it, it always lags a little bit. And maybe AI will help, I don't know. Um, but right now it's, it's lagging a little bit with where, where we, we need it to be in order to help our users uh, analyze the data that they need to analyze. So, um, and I think that, you know, in order to take advantage of IRI, we're right now too far apart and we don't want the trust to erode between us and our users. So we cannot screw up, <laughs> you know, we need to make sure that whatever we give our users, it works and fairly, fairly reliably. Um, uh, other, and otherwise, um, you know, we lose that compact that we have um, with them um, and, and we can't bring them along on this journey with us. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point, Jana. Um, Sterling, Heather, I'll come to you in just a moment. I want to just emphasize something maybe uh, not everyone caught some of the nuance there. Um, a lot of the sort of when we, so Jana was talking about her users, you know, use, NERSC is a user facility. We work with other user facilities like ALS, like LCLS, um, like JGI. Um, who have their own users, and as Jana was saying, have their own compacts with their own users to support them. It's not necessarily that their users are direct NERSC users, and so it adds this layer of um, complexity in how the user interfaces with the, the computing resources that is absolutely, like, it's really important. Yeah, to, we, we, we uh, don't always keep that in mind um, in, at the HPC facilities. Uh, Sterling, do you want to yeah, uh, I mean, speaking about other other challenges, um, your question here about cross center allocations. Um, one of the things that will be very important to us is the resiliency aspect of IRI, where we can point to whichever of the, you know, HPC centers and be able to get whichever one is is up, and uh, assuming that not all three will be down at the same time. Let's hope not. <laughs> yeah. That's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Heather? So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both the previous points. I mean, I think also from, you know, again, from a desk perspective, where our operations are bringing, beginning in 2025, you know, it's it's looking forward to that transition place where, you know, let's say specifically Nurse 10, where, you know, that's really hitting the ground like 2027. Is that at a point where we're, you know, as a, as a project, able to really, you know, how's that transition going to look and how do we pivot and, you know, you know, taking our users with us, but also all, all the software <laughs> and making sure that we can utilize the new, you know, the new system as, as best as we can. And I think a, a part of that is, you know, can we, what can we do to de design? I mean, I, like with an, uh, an API and there's all this potential but do we have the resources to take fully take advantage of that? And so I'm a little bit worried about that. Um, the, another piece is for us, you know, we have you know real time, you know, transient science, and so any transition can be disruptive for us specifically. And we don't want to, you know, we can't you know stop our you know stop our processing necessarily to handle you know a, a big transition. 
Um, and one other little point I, I might make, um, just in general, I mean, I, it looks to me like you know we're moving more toward this containerized software stack, especially if you're going to be looking at a cross-facility situation, which personally, you know, I, I find very exciting. But there's also, you know, can we can we say that you know every software stack can you know can one version of that can you know, container really drop in at all those different centers? And you know that's not immediately clear, but you know something we'll learn as we go. But that might might be a little bit bumpy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can come up here or I can repeat. I think I want to make a couple of comments here. I'm agreeing with all the previous speakers that, you know, reliability is a big, uh, what's the word? Uh, priority for everybody. Sorry, for those who don't know me, I'm the Deputy Operations Manager of the Lux Zeppelin, Dark Matter Experiment. We've been taking data for two years. So as Heather said, real-time monitoring and of, of our instrument and of the dark matter is very important. Um, so I wanted to say two things, and I don't remember which ones. But one of, it, one of them is um, super facility means that if one thing is down, everything goes down. And when the system becomes more complicated, um, this is more likely, not less likely. So even doing redundancy, we may have the problem of losing things because a different site is down. So like in the next week, sorry, I just got the email today. In the next week, NERSC is having tomorrow an outage of per murder, Monday an outage of the DTNs, Wednesday an outage of SPIN and the API super facility API. So it's a whole outage for us. It doesn't matter that you know one thing is going down at a time, our users will not be able to do work we will not be able to do. So this is a design consideration that partial uh, outages affect the, the whole yeah. thing. Second thing is that we've been doing, and Debbie was part of it, so I'm telling her something she already know, but everybody doesn't, um, portability, workflow portability studies. 80% of the work is policy. It's getting around the, uh, the divergent policy. Something that I've been having fun consistently for the last three years is LBL security and networks and DERSC security have slightly different database policies. And that is very expensive for us to maintain or to design around. Um, I think I have a very expensive engineer full time dealing with certificates and authentications across, you know, when you're moving data across things. I don't know if the IRI will have enough clout to tell the, the separate facilities what to do for authentication and policy, et cetera. So those are my two main concerns. Yeah, I, thank you, thank you. I'm very excited for the IRI, by the way. Yeah. If it works, it's great, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, no, very much so. That's one of the things we've really come to really viscerally understand as we've been doing more super facility work that we, we I was talking about complex workflows in the N10 uh, talk yesterday. Complex workflows, if one part of the workflow is not running, then the entire workflow is not running. And that, yeah, this, this adding additional complexity in the workflow does have big implications for uh, resiliency for how we, how we plan things. So I totally agree with that. I also very much agree uh, with your other points, like at least 80%, I'd probably say 80 to 90% is, is policy in this. And this is why the you know, having, you know, that we're having discussions across the Oscar facilities about aligning policies, it is a starting point. Um, but I, I recognize as well that that's, that's going to be, it's not necessarily going to be technical work that we'll be focusing on uh, in IRI. A lot of it will be aligning policies and kind of, especially making sure that security, um, everybody's security policies are satisfied. I think another point that I want to make to build on that is that even when uh, different sites have an identical security policy, and this is something that's happened in within OSG, the Open Science Grid, they might have an identical security and access policy, but the way that it is implemented can vary between sites, which can cause big headaches for users. And so there's a, a there's, it's non-trivial aligning that and making sure that we have the right understanding between sites that, uh, that we can do that smoothly. So, so we, yeah. All these are all these are challenges. Uh, Dula, did you want to add something in? Sure. Um, this is in terms of challenges. So I, I asked um, 
a number of people about their at the at my facility about their thoughts on challenges. So I wanted to give two answers: one from the perspective of our users, and then one per, from the perspective of like our internal computing group. So from our users, I asked one, and he's like, "My problem is NERSC is just labyrinthine. It's just like a confusing and a mess." So I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so that's where <clears throat> our users are coming from. It's just like everything is hard. And another, uh, the, the biggest concern of a few other people was how uh, how access and authorization would have worked out, not in terms of like the federated identity details, but more in terms of who has access to what data and how you're managing all that, who gets the control of all that. Um, from the computing group side, like our internal computing group, I think our biggest um, concern is the need for infrastructure development on our side to take advantage of things like the IRR or super facility. It's been like quite a bit of work for us to, to leverage NERSC because as nice as the tools are that NERSC develops, there's ends up being a, like a lot of development on our side to like connect with them and use them. And that, you know, is more than maxing us out. And then as NERSC evolves and changes, we then basically have to continue to evolve our code and we don't get to control when we have to upgrade our code always. And so it's like a big, it's just like a lot of infrastructure development always needed to be able to take advantage of this stuff. And that's um, hard for us to keep up with. Yeah, this this is that point actually that a couple of you have made now that um, it takes money and time and investment of people to adopt new technologies. That's something that came up very clearly in the architectural blueprint activities that we had within IRI last year. You know, it's very much a community listening experience, um, and that was really one of the biggest points that. Um, and our program manager understands this, that if IRI is to be a success, it cannot be an unfunded mandate for science teams to adopt. And there's no point us in developing some really nice tools or interfaces to make it easier to move your workflows around if you have nobody available, no time or money or funding to, to, to adopt that. So that's something, a conversation that's going to happen on the, on the DOE side is... We, we definitely heard that message. Um, I want to, uh, I don't, I don't think I mentioned this so just quickly. I want to highlight if I can get the slide back. Uh, so I didn't, uh, point this out before, but the, the, the report from the, uh, blueprint activity kind of hard to find. You have to Google like literally the exact title to, for it to come up. It's not easy to find, but if you Google OSTI, which is the, the hosting website, integrated research infrastructure architecture blueprint then you, this will come up yes it's it's you might have to try uh, i don't know architectural blueprint activity when i googled this a few days ago it came up with that but i yeah it's, I, I it's linked it. uh, so if you look for the NISEP, NISEP cfp there's a link to this document there. yeah <laughs> is I can't do anything about Google search ratings. I'm sorry, but this is it's a it's a big report and it contains a lot of materials for from the outbrief. But one of the things that um, we really we heard a lot again. This is something that we heard from people is this concern about uh, 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 not just sort of do we have enough capacity to adopt the next new initiative, but do we you know um that it's it it's hard enough to come to an hpc facility and to understand how to use one if you're coming fresh from you know you ha don't have experience in this before so we cannot have iri be uh, exponentially more complicated to use than just using a single hpc facility it has to be uh, a net benefit to people otherwise it just won't be adopted and i i I think uh, it's fair to say we really recognize that that's going to be a, a barrier to success unless we get that right, unless we have really user centered design, which is a phrase that we used a lot in the activities, unless we really are user focused in, in how we uh, develop this and design this, it's just not going to be worth investing in. So uh, that's a, a it's a, I would say, think it's fair to say that's a shift in how uh, we've design technologies from from the past in a lot of ways. Okay, uh, where were we? 
Uh, is there any anyone else online or in the room who wanted to add their perspective on this? Anything coming up in the chat or the Q and A? Or anyone online? We yeah. have the link in the chat though. Ah, so. Excellent. Good. <laughs> Uh, do you want to? I I, it, could you come up into the microphone? I, okay. The the room mics aren't always. Okay. Uh, I great. wanted to. If I speak here, yes. if I can be heard. Okay, my name is Dirk Hafnagel. I'm from uh, Fermilab, and I work on CMS, one of the LHC experiments. And I wanted to say something on that point about partly cross center, but specifically multi year allocation, because I haven't mm -hmm. heard that much yet in this, during the discussion. So for us, our perspective is a little different because I mean we are a huge collaboration of of scientists. And uh, we've been taking data for 15 years, 2008 we started, and we're going to, I mean, if you believe the plans, we might be taking data for another 20 years. And uh, so the way our computing looks is from the get go, it, the only way to build such a large collaboration is a large international group of people, different countries, different funding sources, everyone wants to spend locally which means the computing is locally, which means you have to tie all of this together. Where this is where the cross center comes in. And now we're trying to integrate HPC. Yeah. So we don't start out from the point, I'm running my computing on HPC and now I might go multiple HPC. We're coming from the point, starting point. We have all of these various computing centers that we're already using. And now we're starting to integrate HPC into the mix. So it's a very different starting point. And then the multi-year allocations the thing is, I mean, we are large, a large collaboration that plans out years, decades ahead. We have schedules when we take data, when we have to do certain processings so that everything fits together and is lined up and we get the science out at the end that we want to get out, the ultimate goal. Which means that doing an application, applying for resources in the fall and then knowing before the end of the year what we have the next year, that's okay right now because we can use whatever we get to supplement what we already have. Mm -hmm. And that's, we call that beyond pledge, beyond agreement, and we make good use of it and it helps our science and we, we, st we get to a point where we start to rely on it for the, for the Monte Carlo samples that we want to produce, for the data we want to reprocess. We, start, we kind of start to rely on it, which means it's, it will start to hurt if it's not available anymore. But any more than that, like increasing the fraction of HPC resources we're using, mm -hmm. like looking ahead, for instance, in 2029, the HL, the high luminosity HLC mm -hmm. will come up, the data rates will go through the roof, the computing demands will go through the roof, the funding agents have yeah. the choice, do they give us more money so we buy way more computers to put in our data centers, do we move to HPC more? But then the point comes, then it's really hurting if we're not getting the resources. And for our internal planning, we kind of have to know more than a year in advance what we will get. Mm -hmm. So that's the perspective from the large collaborations. Now, LHC is, is, is very big, but there are others. There is Neutrino Science, the Dune collaboration will start up on the same time scale. There's Rubin, the, the Sky Survey. Mm -hmm. There's SKA, the, the Astronomy Experiment. They all have similar problems. Yes, thank you. It's a great point. Uh, does anyone, any of the other panelists have thoughts that they want to share about uh, multi-site, multi-year allocations, the importance of this, anything they're concerned about? Uh, yeah, Dula, come on up. Yeah, when I ask people about this, they're like, uh, isn't, that, like isn't that the point of IRI, to not have to do a yearly ear cap? We should just like, people know we're a DOE facility. <laughs> they should just give us a block of stuff. We don't have to renew it, it's just there. So that's, yeah. that's how we feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, point taken. Uh, Heather, then Yana. Yeah, you know, I, I generally agree with that. I mean, I think just having that sense of consistency, knowing what we'll have you know, a couple years down the line would be very, very useful. Uh, that said, I mean, things can change, right? If you're looking, I could say it's a three-year allocation and year three, something happens and we suddenly need more you know, processing or maybe less, right? I mean, how nimble can we be, you know, maybe you know, a little bit more flexibility for something that's, a, you know, something that was set three years ago versus, you know, what, what we know today that we actually utilize. I and mean, I think that's part of the reasoning why we have a, an annual or a cap now, not that I love it, but I mean, you have more of a sense of where you are as a project. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking, so there are two aspects to this. Like one for LCLS, you know, my, my, most of my needs are dependent on what experiments are coming through at any given time. And those experiments are defined by a peer review process, which happens once or twice a year. I don't know six months in advance until six months in advance, what experiments are coming down the line. So I don't know what my bursty media experiments are until about six months before I need them, you know, and that could be, you know, two months from now I need, you know, a, an exascale computer or six months or nine months from now I need an exascale computer. I don't know until that beam time is assigned. And so I, and, and I like a year from now, I have no clue. Two years from now, even less of a clue. I can't even begin to project you know, on that time scale, what I'm going to need, you know, I, I can, I can take a wag at it. I, I, a lot, I can guess that I need a lot, but I can't give you any specifics about what that means or which months or quarters of the year I will need it. So, um, you know, from the LCLS perspective, you know, in terms of giving the, the compute facilities useful information about what my needs are, I would not be able to give it like on any meaningful time scale, except at a yearly boundary, maybe you know, or even a sub-yearly boundary. I can give more refined um, estimates the closer to the beam time I get. Um, and then I can get very precise and very, very good at giving you a footprint of exactly what I need. Um, from a compute facility side, I'm thinking, gosh, what a difficult job is it to build a data-centric compute facility that has to serve both like long-term slow and steady or growing needs for a number of experiments that are going to turn on and be high high bandwidth, high compute need, um, like large data producers in a few years, all plus also serving this high throughput, bursty, um, needy uh, light source LCLS need. <laughs> you know, that's that's a big ask for a data facility, honestly, and uh, for an ecosystem. I mean, a, a data facility, an ecosystem. Um, you name it, like that's very stressful for um, a, a computer to handle, honestly. Like, I don't know how you build something like that, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right, Yana. It is a, a it's, I mean, the, what the re, one of the driving factors behind the IRI development is that uh, DOE and the HPC community recognizes that this is a really difficult problem and any one computing center is probably not going to manage it on, on their own. You know, we're doing, uh, making choices with N10 that will be able to support these different models, but to really support the full breadth of science that, that DOE wants to do in terms of computing, then uh, we have to be able to work together to, to enable it. So. Yes, it's not it's not necessarily going to be easy, but it does have to be attempted. Uh, but I also I, I think you make a really good point about the time timing. Like there's such a variety of uh, of time frames uh, in which people know what they need. Like we 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 need to keep that in mind and not sort of assume that multi year allocations are going to be, you know, the only challenge. In, in, in handling this. Sterling, with your experiments that you work with, you know, the, the fusion experiments, what's the kind of time frame you know, for you? Do you have sort of steady knowledge that you're going to need computing you know, year after year, or is it, is it, does it tend to be more bursty? What's the model look like for you? Yeah, so the, the way that our experiment runs, then we, you know, we run for 14 weeks and then we're down for, uh, you know, a number of months. So or up for 20 weeks or up for 25, or maybe we go back to back years all in a row. So then we get 40 weeks in a row. So, so it is, it, it's bursting in the sense of, um, of yeah, when those allocations fall relative to the ERCAP cycle. Um, and, and in terms of the, the cer certainly to support the experiment, yeah, it, it is bursty uh, on that kind of a cycle. Great, thanks. I think there's a, something in Q&A. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Peng Fei Ding is saying IRI is exciting. Uh, in the aspects of policies, uh, WLCG, so Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, and OSG, Open Science Grid, may provide some good <laughs> lessons to learn <laughs> regarding policies. And then they're also saying that resources in IRI um, technically can also be provisioned for use among WLCG and OSG. Can you elaborate on if there's any interaction between these yeah. facilities? Great. Uh, great to hear from you, Peng Fei. Um, so 
Yes, you make a really good point. This is not the first time that people have tried to put together this kind of infrastructure and we do need to uh, not assume that we are the first and we can learn from work that other people have done. So uh, yes, I, I agree with you. That kind of level of computing policy and uh, that kind of interaction is, is something that we need to, to have as a reference point. Um, there is currently, like I said, we're at a very early stage in this. Um, the activities that are that we're sort of talking about now in the very near term uh, do not encompass uh, uh, sort of collaborating with OSG, but it is uh, part of the roadmap. Is maybe too strong a word, but it's part of the kind of the the, the to do list in of what we want to be looking at in the next year. Uh, you know, we're also thinking about existing tools like Globus and kind of other tools, you know, XRoot D, Rusio, other kind of data movement tools that are in use in the community and kind of uh, lev building off of work that's already been done in, in, in those worlds and making it making that a easier across uh, easier to use across sites. So yes, it's a great point. Any uh, other questions or comments uh, online or in the room? You wanna, do you wanna come up or I can repeat? So one of the pain points when porting a workflow from one facility to another is the fact that a lot of these facilities uh, have different container run times, different job schedulers and so on. So is the plan to wrap these differences around an API or to converge on something in common between all these facilities? Yeah, that's a really good point. So we've been talking about that recently. Um, and I think the plan is to some extent both. Um, the, we are probably never going to have identical runtime environments across multiple compute facilities, just because uh, you know, if we did, then the DOE wouldn't be deploying unique computing resources at different sites. So, uh, we're going to align as much as we can. And so Podman is a re great example of this. Podman's a, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's kind of an industry, now an industry standard container environment that we've been doing work at Nurse to develop. It's something that is probably going to be more portable than, uh, than you know, the shifter singularity kind of uh, environment. So to some extent, we're going to do what we can there. But I, I think your other point is also probably closer to what the user experience might be. And again, this is very early stages in trying to figure out what this will look like. But uh, to the extent possible, we're going to try to wrap a lot of the complexity under API calls. So we might have the same API uh, uh, endpoint at multiple sites. How it actually gets executed under the hood will be different at different sites because people have different uh, infrastructure, different tools, you know, different file systems, all that kind of thing. But from the user perspective, uh, we want to try to hide as much of that complexity as possible. So, but again, this is, we're still trying to feel it all out. But um, yeah, your, your point about containerization in particular is resonates. Other uh, questions or even questions for the panelists? Uh, not all I can ask them something specific. So, um, okay, I'm going to go to the API. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to spin and then the API. And so, ask our panelists. Um, I think everyone uh, on the panel uses uh, spin to some extent in the workflow. Uh, so, how do you see the role of spin and services that run on spin, kind of as, as a component of the API? How do you see that fitting into you to uh, how what work you might do in the future, and it's it's okay if you say uh, you don't. <laughs> You're just curious, like we just want to know, like what's your from your perspective? How do you see some the kind of services like workflow managers, databases, uh, uh, data portals, that kind of thing? Uh, Mary Elaine already mentioned something about the the, the challenges of cross site database uh, uh, configurations. Like, do you does anyone have any thoughts about that? Uh, Dula, uh, and then Heather. Go ahead, Dula. So um, we're like very <laughs> enthusiastic right now about web portals for a lot of things, both for controlling experiments, for analyzing data. So we're like really pushing web portal or like web-based things, and so we're excited about Spin for that. <laughs> I guess our main 
like we've been happy with spin our main question because and you we feel like often you want to co-locate like data compute and other stuff and so i guess our main question is like is do other facilities have a spin like thing and or are they going to so hopefully but that's yeah. that was our question yeah, that's exactly the kind of discussion we're having at the moment. I think it's clear that there's need from the general user community for these services. Uh, figuring out the right model for it is we haven't, haven't, we don't know yet. And to what extent commercial cloud services should be playing a role here as well in being able to mediate workflows across different sites. Again, we want to avoid the single point of failure problem as much as possible. Um, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a real challenge. Okay, Heather, then Sterling. So, so yeah, I mean, for, for desk, I mean, spin has been, a, a hesitant, well, I would just say it probably is a game changer for us in terms of our use of NERSC. I mean, we've come to rely on it, you know, both for, you know, as a public web portal to make some portion of our data available, but also, you know, deploying, you know, specific databases and things that we need to run our pipelines. So, you know, before that, you know, we really couldn't set ourselves up to utilize, you know, a specific, you know, let's say a specific, specific version of Postgres that we would need for our workflows. So I, I don't think we can really entertain a world where, you know, a spin or a next generation spin isn't in an IRI, IRI world, right? I mean, and I think, you know, noting that, I mean, I think what we've learned is, you know, that we have some aspects of our work that really does demand that very high uptime again with our like our time domain science which is looking at transient kind of objects and handling alert streams and that sort of thing i mean even though spin is very much up a lot of the time the little bit of time that it's down it is definitely noticed so i mean i think anything that can be done as far as providing you know cross facility or redundancy you know capabilities across other facilities would would definitely i think ease some of our worries um, in terms of you know the future. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Sterling. Yeah, so I just want to chime in to say that I don't think we use Spin unless the Super Facility API goes through Spin. That's fair. <laughs> uh, Jana. Yeah, I think same here. Um, but I, I think. To be fair, you know, we don't use spin not because we don't need it or we don't, you know, we we do actually need workflow managers, databases, web portals. I think those are vital um, to our operation at LCLS. Users want to interact with things through a, a web interface and you know, click, click, click. This, this is this is the preferred way to do things now. Um, and the only reason I think that we we did not use spin is because our needs predated our interaction with NERSC and SPIN. And so we developed our own homegrown um, system long before we started that interaction. And so when, you know, we, we met up with NERSC and we started doing, doing um, you know, the NERSC interaction, we limited our interaction to, with NERSC to the super facility API because it was cleaner and we were able to keep most of our tools intact. And that was simply easier and, and more efficient for us that way. So. This is this is to say that this spin is great and it's awesome and it provides a capability that I think all experiments do actually need. The reason that we're not using it is because of timing and <laughs> phasing. That's it. Yeah, that's a, a a really good point that we need to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of users want interact with the system and expect to interact with the system through web interfaces. Now it's we need to we need to keep that in mind. Uh, any other well. Any other thoughts at this point? All right, then I'm gonna move on to the API questions. Uh, this is something that really came up a lot when we were talking about IRI. I think it's fair to say that for a lot of uh, people who are involved in the architectural blueprint activities, there are two aspects to what they saw IRI as being. One is alignment of policies uh, and the other is alignment of API endpoints so that you can use uh, an automated workflow across multiple sites. So I, I, we recognize that this is going to be really important and you know, work is already starting at, at, at the sites to, to do this development. 
so I wanted we wanted to hear from everyone like what are what are things that are priorities what do you care most about for common API proposals again like are there things that you want you want us to you, you want to you, you're excited about you're worried about like what should we know about this So Yana just put a hand up, okay, Yana, and then you can then do a. Okay. I, I think the only thing I was going to say is that the policy question, I know it's like boring and it's not technical and it's, but that's, I don't want to solve the same problem six different times across six different facilities. <laughs> I want to solve the problem once and the policy differences are the driving reason you have to solve things six different ways across six different facilities. And so that's the first thing you need to solve. And and it and you're right, it's the, you know, you can have the same policy and have it implemented differently. And so you really have to follow it all the way down into the facility and how it's implemented and solve that problem there. And and only then can you trust that you've actually implemented things properly and and then you have a common interface for the user so i think that's the most important thing yeah great point it's not just about have as you say all the way down otherwise it's not a true common interface yeah it's a great point uh doula and then sterling So when I talked to people, the rumor people had heard on our end was that not everybody out there agrees that there should be an API. So our number one thing was that there should be an API, um, <laughs> just in case there was questions. And then um, I think one thing we struggled with is um, make, so remit, just as you've, if people have pointed out, like we're the we're a facility, and so we have to deal with our interaction with nurse. But then there's the users, which is our users, which is the next step down. And I think one thing we've struggled with is how to give our users easy access to the super facility API mm -hmm. without having them get their own super facility API key, blah blah blah. And so like greasing the wheels for our people to have access to the API um, is important. And then beyond that, just like was said, like having stuff in common. And then I think that one other thing, when I was asking people what their priority was, they wanted an API call that said, are you on? And um, it sounds like that's like already contentious. And so his idea was you lock people, all the computing people in a room, and they can't leave until white smoke goes up and there's like an agreed upon <laughs> call for like, are you on? So like that's that was our advice for you guys. Oh, I like that. Uh, something not far off that process has already happened. <laughs> Yeah, we, it, yeah, yeah, this is, this is actually the, the first kind of demonstration of that we're planning for a cross-site workflow is, is status, status messaging. It's, it uh, should be the least, con we publicly pr publish our status, you know, in the MOTD at different sites. So the message of the day, so this should be, this should, ought to be something that straightforward, but we'll see what happens in practice. But yeah, great point. So, so Dula, is the U the facility? Like, is oh, the sorry. facility on? Uh, yeah, yeah, is nurse, is, nurse, is nurse gone? That's what, that's what, yeah. Yeah, so nurse, like, center status, and of course that's not, you know, there are many components, as we've talked about already, many components to, to nurse, and so giving the status for all of those, uh, and aligning the language we use in that across sites is one of the conversations that's happening now, yeah. Uh, okay, Sterling, then Heather. So we had, um, we had started working with uh, some folks at ALCF and, and they started doing a Globus compute uh, kind of a workflow. And, and so they were able to, you know, come up with something where at the command line, you just give a, uh, the name of the machine that you wanted, whether it's Perlmutter or, or um, <coughs> Polaris or, or, or Summit to be able to, to switch between the different uh, devices. So, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know, how how much API there is involved in in Globus Compute already, but it would be good to I, I don't I I don't understand all of the things that are involved in a API, and therefore I don't know what is involved there already and what what could be implemented from the super facility API. But that you know anything that's common, the common I think is the the most important part. I I don't think it matters all of the other. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, know, absolutely, yeah. There, there are um, really uh, useful and accepted APIs out there in other tools in the community, and we've got to figure out how do we align 
uh, with those. We this is actually working with the Globus team is on the on the plan for the is explicitly planned for this year to kind of understand uh, not just Globus. You know, there are other 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 data movement teams are available, but we are we are specifically wanting to talk to Globus because they have a kind of fully featured uh, compute function that we we got to understand how how that fits in here maybe there's alignment we do maybe there's not we'll, we'll figure that out but yeah I, at the broader point as well that there's other uh other frameworks out there like osg framework that we we need to be considering is a is also a good one uh yeah heather yeah i'm you know, just generally agreeing with everyone. I mean, I think having one user interface would be ideal as much as possible. I mean, one thing I would point out though, you know, is I think it's something Debbie you hit on earlier is about, you know, hiding some of those differences um, or site specific differences behind the API. And I would just caution, you know, there might be instances where maybe you do need to allow someone or an expert setting or something like that to tweak things like a job submission you know there might be areas where you, you don't want everything to be you know, fully um hidden away um i think all the thing i would just generally i mean i think this is the standardization is just i think generally good for our, our early career personnel right i mean you know that they're going to be learning you know if they work at NERSC, they can work at argon they could work you know the, the skills that they pick up will be generally useful. So I, I think that's a, a very good feature overall of what IRI is, is maybe providing. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Heather. All right, well, those are the prepared questions. Any other thoughts uh, from the panelists or questions or thoughts from the room, people online, into the free for all section of the, of the session now, if anyone wants to add anything, ask our panelists something else. See a tentative hand in the back. I'll defer if other people have questions, but I do have one for uh, I think you can go for it, Corey. Uh, you can come up or I can repeat it. I'll, um, I'll come up. Um, everybody, this will either be fun to answer or you won't understand it. So. Um, <laughs> So here's my question. So with respect to, um, you know, this type of workload, distributed workloads, complex workflows and everything like that, um, are there any things where I would like to hear you complete this sentence? Oh my gosh, nurse worries so much about blank, but I wish they would just focus on blank. Does anyone want to try to complete that sentence? Ah, I see. Ah, okay. The first blank would be security. So the the nurse just closes the ticket without yeah yeah so the the question for if anyone didn't hear it is uh, from someone who's a, a Pegasus developer and uh, ran into uh, challenges uh, installing some software at Nurse Condor specifically because it's something that is not allowed uh, on our based on our security policy and so that that can be really challenging when you're trying to run and I think another, like, I'll just emphasize a point that someone made earlier that security policies are different at different sites and that makes it particularly challenging trying to uh, run across different sites you know we have certain security policies we have to comply with uh, and uh, it's not always I think clear to users why we have to make those decisions and we can we can do better at that uh, Sterling I see you've got your hand up there yeah I I think that nurse should care less about uh, keeping up appearances and, and report that 
the truth about their uptime. This came up at the Super Facility Summit last year, and I and I see the the lady. Yeah. Yes, she got her hand up. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, 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 I agree. This is something that we work, we do work on. Uh, we're we're doing a refresh at the moment of our center status page. Uh, it's under development at the moment. Uh, some users have given us feedback on it, and that's going to give us a lot more. Um, I think give everyone a lot more visibility into uh, how things are how things are running. And that's really, we developed that, we put in, initiated that based on feedback from everyone at the Super Facility Summit uh, last year, that this is something that uh, we're not deliberately opaque about things, but uh, not all the information users want to see is available. And yeah. Yeah, there's a, a comment online and then come back to Dirk. Yeah. So uh, Alex Hexamer over at ALS is saying that uh, Yana mentioned uh, that er um, already, uh, but we, light sources, referring to ALS, are very concerned regarding the timeline. Uh, we are producing lots of data now. Within a few years, data rates will increase strongly. When I see the timeline, especially HPDF, uh, we uh, need to develop solutions now. How can we still align development so we are not, uh, uh, or, so I'm sorry, the wording here is confusing, but I guess how, how can this be addressed? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a point is well made. Um, we need to be moving on developing this really quickly. Uh, for those who haven't seen the HPDF, uh, call for proposals the i think the fully operational timeline is 2030 uh, which is some years away it takes some time to stand up a new user facility and yeah these capabilities are going to be needed well before that uh Dirk. just a quick comment on the security comment that was before i mean we're we're currently running we're running on all the access hpc we're running at frontera we're running at nurse we've started or have been fighting get onto LCFs. I have to say, comparing all of them, NERSC is paradise compared to the LCF when it comes to security policies. <laughs> if, if I, I, I mean, we're watching it very closely. If, if it helps to make, make it easier to access the LCFs for us and NERSC doesn't move much, we would be very happy. All right. right. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, again, security policy and security stances different at different sites and different challenges at different places. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how far we'll be. I don't I honestly don't think we'll be when we're not planning on aligning the security stance so that we everyone has the same sort of level. That is something that's just not possible at some of the DOE computing facilities because of the compute that they they do um, because of their mission. So as far as we can, we want to make, you know, make it easier. There's going to be, there's going to be real limitations to that though. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I do want to follow up my comment along the lines that it's true. This is much more open than the other units. It's literally from the side of remote jobs and issues. We need to help ensure the skill of the Allowance to do that. So I think that is a very important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So my, my point more stemming from the installation of a scientific computing package, which is well respected and used by scientific computing yeah. you, you yourself have worked. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a fair point. Okay, in the last five minutes, any other points, questions, or uh, answers to Corey's uh, question? Oh, there's one more online. Yeah, please. Uh, Could you repeat the last person's comments, actually? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, that was um, reiterating that, yes, uh, while at NERSC, uh, we, we, because we have a different security stance to 
uh, we have a different mission to some of the other uh, computing centers. We have uh, the ability to allow, for example, users to submit jobs remotely via API calls. Uh, that's something that other sites are not able to do at the moment. So uh, yay us, um, but it is still the installation, the, the lim limitations we have, restrictions around the installation of some software that requires root privileges is uh, limiting some of the, the applications that can run at NERSC. Uh, so Pengfei is asking, um, basically, are there plans for web-based dashboards that can show stats across all of the IRI uh, resources? That would be useful. Yeah, you're right, that would be. Uh, I wouldn't say there's specific plans for that yet, but uh, I'll, I'll put that on the list. That's a good, it's a good idea. Yeah, um, do you want to come up and ask? Sure. So I, I guess the other part of this beyond compute is also the data transfer between facilities. So is, is the plan to just continue with some Globus connection and is that, sort of an integral part of this discussion? Yeah, it is absolutely an integral part of the discussion. Uh, there, like there are, Globus is part of that conversation, uh, but it's certainly not the only element. We recognize that people do not only use Globus, you know, there are many other data transfer tools and frameworks that people use. Uh, and so we're, it's, it's one of the key priorities for IRI in the next year is uh, uh, aligning is, is understanding where we need to focus our efforts initially to try to try to uh, align usage and policy across the site. So yeah, it's a it's a really important part. I would say that it's um, when we're talking about portability uh, across sites, kind of the data movement is 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 number one on the list of priorities to to figure out. So it's, it can be a big challenge. Any, uh, any, anything else online? Any last comments or? All right, then we'll wrap up. Thank you very much to our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> it's fantastic hearing your, your insights uh, and also from everyone in the room, everyone who's contributed. It's really useful for us to get your feedback and understand what your priorities are, things that, that are concerns. Uh, it sort of helps us uh, prioritize and, and you know learn what we we need to do in the in the future, particularly around IRI. So uh, yeah, please to follow up with us if you have any any additional questions. But thank you very much, everyone, for participating. This has been great. Thank you.